visiting with us, please let us know so we can reach out to you to fill out one of our visitor cards. Uh, we have Monday morning coffee. It will still be going on at parties from 8.30 to 9.30 in the morning. Please, if you can, stop by and have some fellowship. Um, today's altar flowers were placed by me in um, memory of my two dads, Ron Bice and Al Anderson. Um, this time of year, we seem to miss those that we love the most that have gone before us. If you'd like to put flowers on the altar, there is a sign-up sheet on the door as you exit in the narthex if you'd like to bring flowers. And seniors, December's coming up. It's hard to believe the sun is almost here. December uh, 2nd, you'll want to come to Senior Luncheon. It's Friday at 12 noon in the gym. And your entertainment will be Gail Casterline and Miriam Mitt, accompanied by Richard Krim. And they're going to be offering the musical program. So bring a covered dish and plan to attend. Also, save the date for the Parsonage Open House on Saturday, December 17th from 2 to 4 p.m. And then the Christmas Eve service this year is at 6 o'clock here. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and I also want to mention, um, if you are on the SPRC committee here, you, um, I am the chairperson, and we're, I'm calling a brief meeting right after church. Just um, after worship, just it shouldn't take long in the uh, friendship class. Okay. There will also be, and this is in the future, on um, Sunday, February 5th, from 2 to 5, Alders Gate United Methodist Church will be hosting a healthy conflict workshop for Foothills Cluster Churches. And this will be led by Chris Lynch, who is our district congregational specialist. And we'll remind you again because that's in, in February. Are there any other announcements? No. Let us prepare our hearts for worship. <laughs>
morning. morning. And welcome to Advent at Inman United Methodist Church. We'll invite the McInnes family to come up. They'll be doing our first Advent candle lighting liturgy. We're grateful that they are here. said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Psalm 122, a pilgrimage song of David. I rejoiced with those who said to me, let's go to the house of, to the Lord's house. Now our feet are standing in your gates, Jerusalem. Jerusalem is built like a city, joined together in unity. That is where the tribes go up, the Lord's tribes. It is the law for Israel to give thanks there to the Lord's name, because the thrones of justice are there thrones of the house of David. Pray that Jerusalem has peace. Let those who love you have rest. Let there be peace on your walls. Let there be rest on your fortifications. For the sake of my family and friends, I say, please be with you, Jerusalem. For the sake of the Lord, our God's house, I will pray for your good. We are glad, whether we drove in or climbed up, whether we logged on or tuned in, we are glad to be here in this community with this family. It is a place of joyful hope, of radical welcome. It is a place where, together, we can wait in wondrous anticipation of the kingdom to come. Many peoples shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that God may teach us God's ways, and that we may walk in God's paths. this candle as a sign of our hope, our joyous hope that we can be restored, our faith restored, our strength restored, our confidence restored, our joy restored, as we watch and wait with all God's people for the promise to be fulfilled.
grateful and mindful of our thanksgiving all week. We turn to you and we are so grateful that we know there's more going on here than we can see and that you are a part of our lives in ways that we would like to know more about. We ask that you would show us the truth, show us the way that we might find that our gratitude is an ongoing reality because of the life you are giving to us that is abundant. We ask that you would be with all those who are not feeling your presence this morning even as they seek you or forget to seek you, that you are there, pouring your divine and healing light where there's illness, where there is war, where there are those who have uh, been torn from their homes and are now seeking refuge, finding a new place to call home. May they find that in connecting to you that they are already at home. We ask that you would be with those who are in the middle of natural disasters, weather events, earthquakes. This week, uh, we are so uh, mindful of the need around our globe. We ask that you would be with us even this day and this rainy Sunday, uh, the front having gone through and the cold air still here. We are so grateful to be living in a place where we get a true winter, but also we get to see uh, the, the different seasons. But without the blizzards, we pray for those who are still in the, covered by snow, even now. For all the ways that you walk with us, we give you thanks. We ask that you would intercede on behalf of those that are in need as we lift them to you in this prayer during this time, but also all during the week, any time we are reminded or any time they come to mind, be with those who are experiencing a first holiday season without a loved one, that they might find your comfort uh, in the midst of this time. And hear us now as we lift to you the prayer that Jesus taught disciples to pray. He said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. And now, Catherine, if you'll come up. Oh, we're so grateful you're here for our children's message. And we're got, not going to bother. The kneeling Mary is now sitting on the donkey precariously. And so we, we're going to call attention to these folks from the first Christmas. Can you notice a difference this week? In our sanctuary, it's been decorated beautifully. We, need, we have purple pyramids. Purple is, is the color for getting prepared. We use it in Advent. We also use it before Easter to get ready uh, for Easter. But we're going to go back to that first Christmas, before that first Christmas, to the time when Joseph and Mary were called to travel. Uh, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I bet you know this story as well as I do. They were, they were asked to go to Bethlehem. Do you know why? Do you remember why? They did. That's where Jesus was to be born. But Caesar Augustus called for all the folks to return to their hometowns so that a census could be taken because he wanted to get their money from taxes. So that's partly why Joseph and Mary were going. We know there's a cosmic reason, but in their, that day and time, now Mary was, uh, was very pregnant. She was about to have that baby. And as my children, grandchildren say, she had that baby in her belly. And then she traveled. At least she didn't have to walk. She's traveling on that donkey from Nazareth to Bethlehem. That's kind of a long way to be riding on a donkey. It took days and days and days to get there. And you remember that they were traveling that way. And 
They had no idea all the things that were going to happen to them in Bethlehem. This is the first of this story. And so they are preparing. They don't really know. They, they're preparing for the baby to be born. But they're on the journey. And that's where we're going to leave them this week. We have a whole five Sundays of Advent. And so we'll continue this story next time. They're preparing and on their way. And we are preparing and we are on our way as you read so beautifully. It's so fun to hear you all read the scriptures. We thank you all. That was just so moving. Let's pray. <clears throat> Loving God, we don't know what we're preparing for, but we ask that you would walk with us, show us what the next step is, that we might stay in your path for us and in your will. We are grateful that we walk together because none of us are walking alone. We are in a community of faith, walking together with purpose and under your guidance. We are so grateful. In Jesus' name, amen. And now let us continue our worship as we bring God's tithes and our offerings. Come on up, gentlemen. Loving God, we're so grateful for every gift you give to us. We return a portion that it might be multiplied for your kingdom right here at Inman United Methodist Church in Inman, South Carolina and beyond. In Jesus' name.
downstream to the Pacific. And we know what they saw when they got to the top of that mountain. Several ranges of, of smaller mountains, Appalachian-like mountains, and in the distance, the snow-capped peaks of the Rocky Mountains. They had their canoes. They were ready to go. They go to that mountain, and suddenly there were no rivers in sight. The world in front of them, in front of this expedition, was nothing like what had been behind them. The landscape was changed. They were paddlers with canoes. Their expertise was in navigating waterways. The knowledge and the equipment they brought with them was obsolete in this new terrain. Todd Bolsinger suggests this is where we are in the church today. As pastors and as lay folk, there is a new landscape ahead and the knowledge and the equipment we have used before is no longer effective in this new terrain. And don't we want to hang on to all that we have known? Our river knowledge and our canoes? The truth is that while the pandemic exacerbated the decline of our active church participants, the decline was well on its way before the pandemic. And we pastors find that we are a universal, we are a universal disappointment to all the churches that we serve. We are a disappointment because we don't know how to navigate the new terrain. We cannot leave where we have never been. We don't know how. I was taught in the, that continuing education experience I went into in April to take our virtual congregation as seriously as we take our in-person congregation. And so we are living into that new online reality with Amanda's help, thank you God, without any way to confirm our success. In my world, and I believe in yours, it is a success enough that our homebound, who really want to be here in person with us, are able to worship with us still. That much is confirmed, and it's worth our having an online presence just for that. We can be very clear about the reality of our situation. To consider, though, applying anything from the old paradigm to restore the church back to where it has been is no more reasonable than to carry our canoes to navigate the Rocky Mountains. The revelation is that since we don't know how to proceed, we're wandering in the wilderness like the Israelites. We are in a place that we need a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And it seems likely that this is a wonderful opportunity to step aside and to quit using our own thinking learned in the old paradigm and allow God to lead us into the future God has created us to navigate. It seems likely that when we step aside and let God lead the way, we will be living God's will in a new and powerful way. We're climbing up that mountain this year to be made new. We are at the same point, but our goal is different this year. Please God. We do that wanting to be made new. We do that individually, but the reality also is that none of us are made new alone. We need every flawed one of us to move this expedition forward into the new territory. None of us will be made new unless all of us are made new. And please, God,
God let that mean? As is said in verse 4, God will judge between the nations and settle disputes of the mighty nations. They will beat their swords into and iron into iron plows and their spears into pruning tools. I am shocked, and maybe you are too. Who would have guessed that humanity would be at war again? Bombing and killing and destroying infrastructure as we watched on TV growing up, those in my generation, the Vietnam War with the tolls of the casualties. Who would have guessed that a narcissist would believe that it was his right to invade and destroy another country in a delusion that that should be a part of his country. War is a part of our terrain in this new year. Though we'd like to think that that kind of thing is over there, across the planet from us, let's consider though that hate crimes, the money scams, the condemnation of even our own brothers and sisters in Christ is right in front of our faces. Global warming is an increase in horrific weather events, creating that increase, and all that is part of our new terrain. This week, another deadly earthquake. It is easy enough to name the problem. We were reminded in our clergy class of what we already know, when any relational system is gridlocked, it cannot get free simply by more thinking about the problem. We can't get better by canoeing harder, by trying harder. There is a spirit of adventure that we can embrace, a perception that optimizes spontaneous creativity. Step one, a new mindset beyond that which we already know must happen first. The spirit of adventure requires learning a new way of seeing. And there's where we get stuck, we human beings. Because, behold, a new way of seeing results in our facing loss of the old way of seeing. We need mountain climbers now, and it's time to ditch those canoes. But canoeing is what we know. The world in front of us is nothing like the world we have known. What we used to know is a world where the church had home court advantage. People needed Jesus. People sought Jesus. And the churches were filled. Now we are in a crisis. We would think that in a crisis we would rise to the occasion. But the truth is that in a crisis what we do is default to our training. Our training has us paddling harder to no avail. Maybe it has us blaming church leadership, meaning the lay people who are leading our congregations, or blaming the pastor, or blaming the larger church for the symptoms of the crisis. I've heard something like, if we could only get past 2024, then we could thrive. People won't come back until that's done. Is that true? Seems like it might be. Is that absolutely true? People weren't coming back already before the general conference was gridlocked, before the pandemic. We were told we don't have a technical problem, one that can be fixed by getting an expert to come and fix the heater and air conditioning, or to land the plane, or even to teach how to to talk about the Trinity without being uh, without heresy. Those are more technical problems, we don't have a situation in which an expert can be found to solve the issue. 
What we have is an adaptive problem. I guess that means we need to adapt to the new situation. That wasn't said, but that's my own thinking. There's no solving an adaptive problem with our existing knowledge. What we face has created a need to shift our expectations, our attitudes, our habits of behavior. Can we do that? It is in times of great change that learners inherit the earth. Learners inherit the earth because the learned find themselves beautifully equipped for a world that no longer exists. How can we become learners? How can we go and make learners of all the world? Disciples and learners are two translations of the same Greek word. What I've described is a picture of the human condition that we all, with our mutual definitions of the world, have defined. What if we forget what we've decided is our reality and get on with being made new? Mr. Bolsinger reminded us that people, that's us, people, we don't resist change, we resist loss. We resist the loss it takes to let go of something so that change can come. We might see and understand that in a traditional institution, no innovation is possible. It's a traditional institution. And the institutions are so interested in the survival of the institution. Our identity is so tied to the present reality of those institutions, of religion, education, government, that we cannot seem to move forward into the world in which we are living. Here's some good news. Aren't we ready for it? We don't worship an institution. We worship a living God. Here's the truth for those who are seeking God, seeking to come and be part of a group, a community that worships and can share their faith. It is our gift in the church that we can stay disciples. We can stay learners, learning about the kingdom of God and the next step toward that kingdom. That is our gift given to us to share to the world. And when we see that the institution is becoming an idol to preserve and to worship, we can choose to turn to the altar of God. Please, let's not throw out the source of our being because the institution is no longer thriving. We have access to a spiritual realm that is waiting to answer our question what is the truth here? There's more going on than we can see with our body's eyes. We are a part of that movement and love and light. That spiritual realm, that spiritual realm is our home and our sustenance. And when we let go of what the outer circumstances look like, and hold on to the leading of the Holy Spirit, that advocate that teaches us all that Jesus taught, and even more than that, when we hold on to that teacher, we will be led forward for the sake of the kingdom of God right here at Inman United Methodist Church. For those that we would invite to join us, those who are hungry for a community of learners with whom they can navigate the reality of 2022 and on the cusp of 2023, people with whom they can make a difference in this world, 
we can be that community of learners they can find. Here's a harsh truth. Nobody seeking to find the community of the kingdom of God cares whether the institution survives or not. Seekers care if our institution cares about them. Our invitation, our Christian invitation this morning, or wherever, whenever you might hear this, is to pay attention to what is, not what has been. To recognize that we, none of us, know how to make all this new. We do know intimately the one, and we serve the one who does know and is eager to lead the way. When we are willing to let go of authorizing what should be and allowing God's will to be done, we will find ourselves on that mountain of God as instruments of God, being taught holy ways and walking holy paths. We are invited to walk in the Lord's light. In this, our New Year's Day and beyond. Happy New Year's. This is the first day of our Christian year. Our first steps of the journey together being made new. Let's be curious to see what happens next. Let us pray. Loving God, we are grateful that we're not required to know the way. We are required to listen and to follow the one who does know the way, the way to love and truth and light, the way to joy and peace, Patience, kindness, goodness, all the spiritual gifts. May we find that they are the true gifts underneath that Christmas tree this year. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you will, get your bulletins and turn to our statement of faith. Let us say together what we believe. We stand. We believe in God, who has created and is created, who works in others and us through the Spirit. We follow in the way of Jesus, separating God's presence, living with respect in creation, loving and serving others, seeking justice and resisting injustice, and seeking out hope and peace. We believe every person, regardless of color, religion, creed, age, class, or orientation is a child of God. We are connected because we are family. We gather because we all have something to share. We encourage one another and hold each other accountable. But most of all, we love one another. Thanks be to God. Amen.
us go from this place, making room in our hearts again this Advent for the one who will lead the way for us. And let's buckle up. If we're willing, our God will take us on quite a journey this year. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.